Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Eva, are the gifts there? Yes, Diego Bertati, they've all in your car. What about the Christmas tree? Our employees bought and delivered the tree to the designated address this morning, and during lunchtime, Gustavo and Filippo went to decorate it. Diego glanced at his watch. He had planned everything correctly. Today, since the morning, everyone in the entire orphanage, including the director, was having fun. The youngest kid started at the theater, then moved to the playroom, while the older ones went skiing at one of Diego's resorts. Once the children left, the orphanage buzzed with activity. They brought in the Christmas tree, set it up, and the girls were supposed to decorate the assembly hall and dress up the tree. In the evening, after their return, the children would have dinner and go to bed, and the next morning, the celebration would begin. Diego smiled. It was fortunate that their town had a relatively small orphanage with only 50 children. If there were 200 kids, he wouldn't be able to organize such a festive for them. His phone vibrated in his pocket, and Diego answered without looking at the screen. Diego, what does all this mean? He frowned and moved the phone slightly away from his ear. Cornelia, what's the matter again? Why are you so upset? Cornelia was his fiancée, or rather, she considered herself to be his fiancée. He had remained silent, neither saying yes nor no, just waiting. He was aware he was 27 years old, and perhaps it was time to get married, but he wasn't sure. Yes, he appreciated that she went with him there from the capital, but only at first. Later on, he realized that Cornelio was convinced he would return to the big city. She often said, Isn't it time to make amends with your father so he can bring you back from exile? For some reason, Cornelia had assumed that Diego had quarreled with his father. I like it here, and I don't want to go back anywhere. Of course, you're going to say you intend to live here for the rest of your life? Actually, that's exactly what I intend to do. Cornelia looked at him, smiling, but she behaved in the way that she didn't believe him at all, and he didn't try to convince her otherwise. In his eyes, Cornelia seemed like a doll, and the more time they spent together, the more he was sure that she lacked intelligence, and her thoughts were solely focused on money. She was the daughter of a rather prominent businessman. Diego met her at the birthday party of one of the golden youth. Although he didn't particularly enjoy such gatherings, he occasionally had to socialize in those circles. Cornelia immediately clung to him, taking the initiative in their relationship. On that very night, they spent together at her one-room apartment. Cornelia was undeniably beautiful, perhaps even too much so. At that time, he thought her appearance resembled a Barbie doll, finding it somewhat intriguing. However, now, emphasizing the doll-like similarity, it evoked entirely different emotions in him. What upsets me? It upsets me that my fiancé is an idiot, she said. Diego frowned. He couldn't stand it when people crossed boundaries, even those close to him. What do you mean? He asked. What are you pretending to be stupid for? I've been telling you for a week that I want to throw a fantastic party, and you hesitate as if you don't have any money. And today, I find out you're organizing a celebration for those brats again. I don't think it's any of your concern, that's first of all. If you want a party, go ahead, but not in my house and not with my money, that's second of all. And most importantly, Cornelia, I think it's time for you to go back home. She gasped in outrage. Back home? Really? So, you used me, and now I'm no longer needed? Did I ever tell you that I needed you? You decided to come here by yourself. You didn't even bother to ask if I needed it. You just came and settled into my house. Cornelia hung up, and Diego sighed. Why did everything have to be so complicated? He returned to this town because, once, he had spent two years in this very orphanage. The memories were heavy. If it weren't for the director and the caregivers, he doubted he would have ever managed to return home to his father. Diego sat down, his legs felt heavy, and his head was throbbing. It was always like this whenever he recalled that time. Diego's father was one of the first to strike gold during the crisis. 
In just a year, he transformed from a regular engineer into a true businessman, owning factories, newspapers, and steamships. When he became wealth, problems, as to say competitors, started to appear. Christian Bertotti knew that his rivals were capable of anything, but he didn't think it could cost him and his family their lives. They persistently urged him to give up the lemonade factory and switch to producing illicit alcohol, which was highly profitable at the time. However, Christian didn't like backing down without a valid reason. The threats began pouring in, and his wife, Camelia, was deeply worried, not so much for herself, but for their son. Yet, Christian reassured her that it was merely psychological pressure. She always trusted her husband. They were attacked while strolling in the park. Camelia fought to protect their son until the very end. Probably they wanted her to get hurt, and they did. Attempting to take the child from his mother, they inadvertently took her life. Christian learned about it almost immediately. Within 15 minutes, all his men were searching for those who took his son while he rushed to the hospital where they had taken his wife. But he barely had time to hear the woman saying, Christian, save him, before he angled his gun to the doctor's face. During those times, it was rare for businessmen not to have such a toy. Save her, save her. He pleaded. The doctor paled but didn't look away. She's gone, there's nothing we can do. Christian stared at him for another minute, then lowered the gun and knelt beside Camelia's bed. The search for Diego continued for over three months, with intense efforts in the beginning, but gradually tapering off. The investigator averted his gaze, and Christian, of course, knew that with each passing day, he lost hope of finding Diego alive. Diego was sent to some children's hospital. The boy hardly spoke and looked at everyone with haunted eyes. His body was covered in bruises, but he remembered nothing, not a single thing. Apparently, his brain had blocked it out, whether from witnessing what happened to his mother or some other reason, of which there seemed to be plenty. Diego recalled how terrified he had been, despite being only five years old, an inhuman horror had gripped his soul. The thing that was even scarier was that he couldn't remember anything at all, just a black void in his mind. Later, they transferred him to an orphanage in a small town located 600 kilometers away from his home. He was all alone there, in a small, almost family-like environment, where caregivers worked hard. It took them two years for Diego to start coming back to life. He remembered that time. He would wake up, have breakfast, and sit by the window. Diego was waiting, he didn't know exactly what for, but he was certain that he just needed to be patient. One Christmas Eve, something happened that somehow shook Diego's consciousness. They brought a Christmas tree to the orphanage, not very dense, a bit crooked, but a real one. The caregivers brought some ornaments from home and, together with the children, made a garland. On that day, all the kids were decorating, and Diego also took an ornament. It was a small ball with foil stars inside. He raised his hand and froze. His mom loved such ornaments. She always said they had snowflakes inside. But Diego's mom was gone. He now realized it clearly, and his dad was gone too. Because Diego had lost him. He dropped the ball, which shattered loudly, and covered his face with his hands. A caregiver rushed to him. She saw how pale the boy became and how his hands trembled. Diego, what happened? She asked. He looked at her with wild eyes and repeated, They killed my mom. They promptly took Diego to Dr. Adriana Sanchez. He spoke for a long time with his eyes closed, telling Dr. Sanchez everything that suddenly emerged in his mind. An hour later, she had to administer a calming injection to Diego. When the boy fell asleep, Adriana went to the director. We need to look into records from two years ago. I got to know that Diego's father is a wealthy man, and his mother died in front of him when they tried to take him away. I'm sure we'll find something. Several hours later, the women had Christian Bertotti's phone number. Carmen Borrego called him. Christian Bertotti? Yes. We're calling you from the orphanage. The voice she heard on the phone was unemotional, and Carmen Borrego was a bit taken aback. She had been the director not too long ago, but still hadn't fully learned how to handle such situations. 
Which orphanage are you calling from? The man interrupted her. She quickly began telling Diego's story. The man cut her off. Have you informed the police? No, not yet. We decided to talk to you first. Do not inform them. I'm on my way, he said. Carmen hung up and looked bewilderedly at Adriana. What did he say? He said he's coming, and we shouldn't inform the police for now. Why? I don't know. But what if it's not him, but one of those who? Adriana, stop scaring yourself. But a couple of hours later, they eventually called the police. After everything that had happened, all of Christian's senses were heightened. As soon as he heard the female voice saying they were calling from the orphanage, his heart skipped a beat. He could have stopped listening because he was sure they had found Diego. But then another thought struck him. If the police in that town had concealed the fact of finding a similar child and distributed his pictures nationwide, then perhaps things weren't that simple there. Maybe those people who took Diego were connected to those in authorities, or they paid them off. It was good that Diego was found, but it was also dangerous for the boy. Christian urged the driver to go faster several times. Carlos, please, go faster. Carlos sighed. Mr. Bertotti, you know I'm a good driver, but on roads like this, 80 miles per hour is the limit. I assure you, we don't know what will happen to the car after this race. Carlos, don't care about the car, we'll buy new ones. Yes, new cars, but can you buy yourself? Trust me, riding faster is dangerous. Christian sighed. He knew Carlos well and understood that he was telling the truth because the road left much to be desired. There was a security CA following them, literally five meters away, and Christian took him along precisely because he had too many questions. The police arrived another two hours later. Carmen Borrego was very surprised when one of them said they had to take the boy with them. This is out of the question. We are responsible for him, and until there are appropriate orders, he will not leave this place, Carmen said. One of the arriving officers looked at her with an unfriendly look. I don't understand. Are you challenging police orders? Carmen looked bewildered at him, then said, Show me your license. I will call your superiors. The second officer suddenly pressed the director against the wall. Bring the boy here quickly. Adriana rushed to help her boss, but she was immediately pushed aside. She would have fallen if someone hadn't caught her. The people who identified themselves as police officers were lying on the floor, restrained by strong guys. A man was standing in front of Carmen. I asked you not to call the police. But I thought it was necessary. What if you are the one who got rid of the boy's mother? Christian jerked. Diego knows his mom is gone? Yes, he remembered everything yesterday. I told you before, Carmen replied. Where is he now? Christian felt he had to see his son urgently, had to hug him urgently, otherwise he would simply go crazy. He's sleeping. The boy had to be given a sedative. Christian didn't get a chance to ask anything else. A piercing cry echoed in the hall. Dad, Daddy. The man turned slowly and saw Diego. He emerged from some door, looking at Christian with teary eyes. My son. Christian walked down the corridor, and Diego ran towards him. He grabbed his son and held him close. Diego, my boy. They never parted again. Diego had to recover for a long time. For a while, he would scream at night, waking up from nightmares, but his father was always there for him. He took his son to the sea, taught him how to ski. They spent a lot of time together. When school started, the child's thoughts shifted a bit. When he was already in the junior school, he asked his father, Dad, can we talk? Christian put aside his papers. Of course, what happened? Diego sat down next to him. You know, Dad, Christmas is coming soon. I want the orphanage to have a holiday too. When you found me, there were no gifts there. Well, we made something ourselves and put it under the tree for others, but all children expect their parents to become their gifts. I have my gift, but they have nothing. Maybe we could go there. 
I looked, and I have many toys. We would surely gather enough to share with everyone. Christian looked closely at his son. Are you willing to part with your toys and give them to those children? Yes, Dad. Carmen Borrego is very kind, and everyone there is good, but there are hardly any toys. Everything is old. Christian hugged his son tightly. Of course, Diego, we'll go, but you don't need to take your toys. I'll buy new ones. Diego pulled back. But, Dad, that's a lot. It's too expensive. It's not more than money, son. Diego embraced him with both hands. You're the best dad. Christian frowned, as if he wanted to cry. When they arrived at the orphanage, Diego froze. He carefully was looking at everything, and Christian couldn't understand what his son was thinking about. Carmen Borrego came out onto the street. She looked surprised at the large vehicle that looked more like a bus. When Christian Bertotti stepped out from behind the wheel, the woman smiled hesitantly. Is it you? Is something wrong with Diego? Diego quickly jumped out and rushed to her. She hugged him back and even shed some tears. Diego, you've grown so much, I can hardly recognize you. Carmen, I still get straight A's in school. Christian smiled. What about your good grade in choreography? Diego waved it off. Dad, that's not academic, just choreography, and I'll improve, for sure. Carmen Borrego laughed. Of course, you'll get better, and, by the way, let me tell you a secret, grades aren't that important, the most important thing is to be a kind person. She straightened up and looked at Christian. I really don't understand, did you come just to visit us? Well, you could say so. Diego missed everyone. Come in, we'll all be glad to see you. Diego, do you remember Marlene? She was always following you around like a shadow. I remember her. Did her parents come for her? Not yet, but you came just in time. She has an aunt, and after Christmas, Marlene will go to live with her family. Diego smiled. She really wanted that. And do you remember Domingo, the one who used to fight all the time? We sent him to a sports section, and the coach says he'll become a great athlete. That's awesome. Diego was smiling, and so was Christian. His son rarely was smiling like that. Carmen, we didn't come empty-handed. Here you go. Do you have anyone who can help to unload things? He pushed the doors open, and the astonished caregiver saw the car's interior that was tightly packed with various boxes and bags. What is all this? She came closer and picked up one of the boxes. A toy car. Then she picked up another. A board game. What is all this? These are toys for you, for Christmas. Well, not just toys and books, there's also some clothing. It's Christmas, after all. Christian smiled somewhat awkwardly. It turns out that giving gifts so unselfishly wasn't as easy as it seemed. It might appear like everything was in order, but when he looked into Carmen Borrego's eyes, he almost drowned in them. They were grateful, surprised, teary, and shining. He could have gone on endlessly trying to find words to describe her eyes, but she looked away. Christian couldn't help but think that she was barely 30 years old and already a director. They decided not to unload the gifts immediately, but to wait until the children were asleep so they wouldn't see. Everyone helped, educators, nannies, and even the janitor. Carmen was delighted like a child. There are so many dolls, and we have more girls than boys, and there are hardly any decent dolls left. So they have to wait in line to play with some old doll. Christian understood that this was true, and it made him so sad. How could it be that children had to wait in line just to play with some old doll? The next day, Christian saw how happy the children were. He had never been particularly sentimental, but here, he decided that he would come here with Diego every Christmas. And they did just that, and they were eagerly awaited. As Christian himself said, he had never been welcomed so warmly anywhere else. When Diego turned 20, his father gradually introduced him to the people in his company, and it must be said that Diego excelled at everything. Christian smiled with satisfaction. 
You know, son, you'll go far. I can see that. Diego turned 23, and his father started talking about expanding their business. You know, Diego, I think together we can achieve great things. While I'm still strong and capable, we can accomplish a lot. Dad, what are you talking about? You're not planning to retire already, are you? Well, not right now, but believe me, that time will come faster than I know it. And when it does, I won't even realize it. Come on, you'll always be young. And about expanding, I have an idea. I did some research and found a place where there are fewer businesses like ours. I know what I want to offer you. Christian was sitting next to his son, who was spreading papers on the table. Well, show me, I see you've prepared thoroughly. Yes, I had to spend some time on it. I even thought that those who ran businesses in the past were real heroes. Why so? Because there was no internet, and you had to wait for answers for weeks or travel to get them. And even then, gathering information wasn't as fast as it is now. Christian smiled. You're right about that. Nowadays, everything is too fast, no pleasure at all. They stayed up until late at night. When they finished, the father looked at Diego. You've done a great job. If you find a suitable location, go ahead and do it. Of course, I'll help, but that territory will be yours. We'll set up a branch, and everything will be in your power. Do you want me to become the head of the branch? But Dad, I have little experience. I had no experience at all when I started the business. Back then, it was almost like you are now. So, my son, go ahead. Diego came to the small town where it was beautiful spring weather. He got out of the car happily and stretched. It feels so good. Yes, it really was wonderful. The leaves were just unfolding, and they seemed to have a fragrance of freshness. The wind carried it for anyone who wanted to enjoy it. Diego smiled, apparently, this is how spring smelled. He couldn't remember how it was here in the spring. Either he didn't go for walks in the orphanage, or he did but forgot. He and his father always came here only in winter, always on the eve of Christmas. By the way, Diego made a wish to come to the orphanage himself this Christmas with gifts. Or rather, he wished to earn money for the gifts. His father had always been in the food business, but Diego decided to expand and open not only stores with their products, but also try himself in the restaurant business. He had always wanted to do that, and after thinking for a bit, his father said, go ahead. Well then, I can't stop you. I even can say that this idea seems very interesting to me. And here was Diego, riding in the car, with several business plans he had worked on for a long time. Now he needed to find accommodation, and everything else would come later. He didn't want to stay in a hotel, he knew the kind of service they offered there. Diego got in the car and dialed a number. Hello, Carmen Borrego. Diego, hello. I'm so glad to hear from you. Is everything all right? Carmen, I'm not far from the orphanage. Is it okay if I stop by for a coffee? Diego, why are you even asking? Of course, come over. Nothing has happened, has it? No, everything is good. Well, all right, come on over. Diego parked the car a little away, entered the pastry shop, and bought a small cake. Hello, Diego, Carmen hugged him. Did something happen? Why did you come here now and not on Christmas? She was asking, but she quickly set the table. I came here for business. We want to open a branch of the company here, Diego replied as he sat down, lost in thought. I'm not sure what to say. I think it's a very good idea. There isn't much work in our town, and young people have nowhere to go. But why here? There are bigger cities nearby. The thing is, this town is located in the middle of the country. It's very convenient to reach all the other towns from here. You're right, I've never really thought about it before. My dad said the same. Carmen Borrego suddenly lit up, looking like she was not over 50 but under 20. How is Christian? He's doing well. 
Carmen Borrego fell silent, gazing out the window, and Diego wondered if he had ever known if she was married or not. Carmen, I'd like to rent an apartment and find a good housekeeper for myself. You know, someone who can do the ironing, cooking, because I have absolutely no time for that. Of course, I will pay very well. Wait, I need to think about it. For a while, Carmen was keeping silence, tapping her pen on the table. I think I can help you. We had an older woman working as a cleaner, but it became too hard for her, so she left. She's very neat and calm. She worked because her apartment was big and the utility bills ate up all her income. Let me find her number. Ten minutes later, Carmen Borrego was already calling her. Hello, Esmeralda Gallardo? How are you? How are things? For some time, she just listened, nodding occasionally, then she started talking again. Esmeralda, I remember you have a spacious apartment. I have an acquaintance who came to the city. He is looking for a place to rent and have someone take care of him. She laughed. No, no, he's an adult, just with a lot of work, and he needs to eat, put on clean shirts. Yes, yes, good. I'll give him your address, and he'll be there soon. She hung up the phone. Well, I think you'll like Esmeralda. Diego stood up. Thank you, Carmen. You've been so helpful both then and now. Oh, come on, Diego. You do so many things for our orphanage. He had already reached the door, but then turned back. Tell me, I never knew. Are you married? Do you have any children? Carmen Borrego looked at him attentively and then sighed. No, first I studied, then threw myself into work. My heart ached for the children. You know, my lovers considered me abnormal and ran away. For the first few years, I couldn't stop crying, but at work, I held myself together so the children wouldn't see, and as soon as I left, I would cry. So many broken destinies, such terrible stories. I kept thinking later, later, and then I looked back, and it was all gone. But I'm not upset. Men are not that important. Children are what matters. These little people who have already experienced betrayal at such a young age. Diego saw how difficult it was for her to share these words, and he understood her completely. He had witnessed Carmen being like a mother to abandoned children, and they loved and respected her. Even amid noise and chaos, if she spoke softly, everyone would fall silent and listen to her. People like her were called the teacher of God. You are the best woman, and I've never met anyone kinder than you. Overwhelmed with emotions, Diego hugged Carmen Borrego. She immediately took out a handkerchief and wiped the corners of her eyes. Oh, come on now, go already, or Esmeralda will be waiting for you. Diego left the office and headed to his car. He wondered if his father noticed how the director reacted when his name was mentioned. He quickly pulled out his phone. Hey, Dad, I'm here, sure. Just was speaking with Carmen Borrego, he said, and it seemed like his father's voice trembled. Diego talked to him a little more, hung up, and stopped by his car. Maybe I'm a fool, but it looks like my dad is even more foolish. He turned into the courtyard of an ancient, well-maintained house. The building truly had an old-fashioned charm, even with the ornate details above the entrances and under the windows. It was like a genuine historical monument. I've never lived in a monument before, Diego thought. Apparently, he was looking around too obviously as he caught the attention of an elderly woman. Do you like it, don't you? She said. He turned to face her. The woman was petite, but her eyes were surprisingly young and mischievous while she herself looked like a dried mushroom. Very interesting. When was this house built? And if you look more carefully, you'll find the construction date. The old woman smiled, showing her teeth, and Diego couldn't help but be surprised to see that she still had teeth when he noticed what she mentioned. He burst into laughter, finding it strange not to notice the two-meter digits on the wall. Wow, it's over a hundred years old, he exclaimed. Did you really succeed to see it? The old woman laughed. Tell me, Grandma, how can I find Esmeralda Gallardo? How dare you to call her grandma? She's not even 80 yet, 
just turning it next year. And Esmeralda Gallardo is me. I've been waiting for you here for half an hour. I don't know which way you came, but you can go around the whole town in 15 minutes. Diego laughed again. He had taken a liking to Esmeralda very much. I apologize. Please forgive me. I feel awkward for being late. I've been to this town many times, but it's my first time here in the spring. The woman softened. Yes, we have a beautiful town here. You're right. And I know you come here often. I recognize you. You and your dad visited during my shift. I know why you come. Diego remained silent, and the old woman no longer demanded an answer. She slowly walked ahead of him towards the entrance. Don't worry, my home is clean and tidy. I do a lot myself, but my granddaughter scolds me and tells me to wait for her so she can help me with the cleaning. But I manage just fine without her. Diego could barely keep up with the spry old lady. Do you also have a granddaughter? Of course, I'm a normal person. Why wouldn't I have a granddaughter? Does she live with you? No, she's independent. She's 20 years old, and she's working. She helps an old woman like me. He sighed with relief. At least no one would distract him. He could work and relax peacefully. Not that Diego was against anyone, but he knew there would be a lot of work. When they entered the apartment, he looked around with interest. It seemed as if time had stopped in this apartment and quite a while ago. Perhaps even in the post-war years. Antique furniture, paintings on the walls, who knows how old they were. But Diego wouldn't be surprised if the paintings were worth more than the apartment itself. Well, come in, I have four rooms. One is quite large, and the other three are smaller. In one, there's my bedroom, and the other two are vacant. I think you'll be more comfortable in this larger and brighter one. The room was indeed cozy, with a large bed from some ancient times, sturdy and massive, and a gigantic wardrobe. Diego even thought that if they ever needed to move it, it would require more than just two people. The table had tiger paws instead of legs, quite interesting. What an interesting place you have, he said. The old woman smirked. What's so interesting? It's all old stuff. It was clear she said it in jest, as she loved her home. Let's continue, he said, following her. Here's the bathroom, the toilet, and this is the kitchen. By the way, write me a list of what and when you want to eat. Just buy the groceries yourself, as I mostly eat porridge and potatoes. Diego nodded with a smile. He wondered what the old woman used to do for a living. He had a feeling she might have been a boss or a foreman, though he didn't know why he thought that. He brought his belongings from the car, unpacked them, and took out his laptop. He needed to see what cafes and restaurants were already in town and then go check them out. About two hours later, someone knocked on the door and Esmeralda Gallardo appeared. Diego, you didn't tell me anything about the food. Stop working for some time. Let's go have some coffee and sort everything out at once. He pushed the laptop away. Esmeralda was right. Everything had to be done in order. They were having delicious coffee and chatting. Mrs. Gallardo, I'm not picky. You can feed me anything. I'll be waking up at different times, but never later than 8. And I can reheat the food myself if needed. No way, I won't have that. I'll charge him, and he'll be reheating his own food. No, thank you. And just call me Esmeralda, that's what I'm used to. Let me leave you some money for groceries, and you can buy whatever you need. I'm not a big fan of going to the shops. I have enough of them at work. All right, so you don't mind what I cook for you? Not at all, he placed the money on the table. The old woman looked at them with surprise. Is this for half a year? Now it was Diego's turn to be surprised. Why for half a year? For two or three weeks, tell me how much you'll need. To spend all this, I'd have to buy delicacies. He laughed. Esmeralda spoke in a very interesting way, not trying to replace phrases or words with smoother ones. But most importantly, her intonations were so lively that it would be impossible not to understand what she meant. 
he heard the old woman go somewhere with the corner of his ear. Then she cursed in the kitchen because the prices were outrageous and then gently clinked the dishes, preparing something. The kitchen filled with such a wonderful aroma that Diego nearly drooled. He couldn't sit in the room any longer and went out. Esmeralda was sitting in front of the old TV, watching TV series attentively. Diego realized they started showing this series when he was a child. Esmeralda turned around. Diego, dinner will be ready in 15 minutes. Okay, he sat down on the couch and also looked at the screen. The TV was constantly flickering, and Diego couldn't really grasp what the episode was about. His eyes even started to hurt. Esmeralda, how can you watch it? It must be painful for your eyes. Well, there's no other way. I tried just listening, but it's not as interesting, and it doesn't always flicker. Sometimes it's fine. She seemed to be defending the TV, on whose screen credits were already rolling. All right, let's have a dinner. The smells from the kitchen were so enticing that Diego wanted to quickly sit at the table and start feasting. As soon as they entered the kitchen, a loud alarm clock rang. Esmeralda slapped it. I remember, I remember. Diego looked surprised, so Esmeralda explained. Whenever I put something in the oven, I always set an alarm clock. There hasn't been a time yet when I forgot, but you know, with age... She said it so casually that it tugged at Diego's heart. Esmeralda prepared meat with mushrooms, bell peppers, and potatoes. Diego had been to many restaurants, but he had never tasted anything so delicious. As he leaned back against the kitchen couch, he said, I've never eaten anything like this before. Esmeralda laughed. Oh, it's nothing. When you try what my granddaughter cooks, you'll struck. Will she poison me? She looked at him in surprise, then burst into laughter. But if she does, it'll be delicious poisoning. Diego laughed. Esmeralda described her granddaughter as an independent woman and a good cook, and he wondered what she was like. He got the chance to meet her a couple of days later. Just as he was turning into the courtyard with his car, he saw a girl. It had been raining since morning, and the puddles were almost knee-deep. Either he spotted her too late, or she was deaf and didn't hear him. But somehow, he managed to splash her quite significantly from a puddle. The girl jumped back, and he immediately stopped. Though he didn't think he was to blame for it, he decided to apologize. The girl turned towards him, enraged to the point when the sparks and lightning could almost be seen in her eyes. Diego couldn't reply immediately because he was simply astonished. Please excuse me, I didn't notice you. The girl took out her earphones, and he immediately understood why she hadn't heard him. Excuse me, are you out of your mind? Racing around the courtyard where people, including children, walk, she paused for a moment, cats and dogs walk here too. It's not a racetrack for you. I wasn't racing, I was driving calmly. Can't you see how deep these puddles are? Why are you walking right at the edge of the road? I'm walking on the sidewalk, you know? That's where I should be walking. Miss, why are you yelling? I already apologized. If you want, I can pay for your dry cleaning. She even stomped her foot. Buy yourself brains instead. But that was too much. Miss, you're being rude. And a rude person is saying this to me, the one who can't even drive properly. She turned around and walked away. Diego watched her for a moment and then jumped into his car, quickly accelerating. But, once again, fate had it that there was another puddle ahead, and right across from it was the same girl he had splashed a few moments ago. He knew it was too late to break. He closed his eyes for a second as a wave of muddy water flew towards the girl. In the rearview mirror, he saw her threatening him with her fist. Diego barely found a parking spot. It seemed like everyone remembered they had cars when it started raining. His car was bulky, so he had to maneuver carefully to fit it into the available space. By the time he parked, the rain had stopped. The sun peeked out on the horizon, and his mood improved slightly. Look at her shouting like a queen. He thought to himself. Let her scream at her husband at home. Diego thought all this as he recalled those eyes that sparkled with anger, and he couldn't help but smile. 
Our course, life never would be dull with her around. He quickly climbed the steps and opened the door. Esmeralda had given him the keys to the apartment on the first evening, saying, You're young, who knows when you'll be coming back. I can't keep running to open the door for you, young man. Someone was talking in the kitchen, and he peered in to greet them, but was taken aback. Those same eyes were looking at him. So, Grandma, this rude monster is now standing in your kitchen and staring at me as if I am a ghost. Don't tell me that this is your new tenant. Esmeralda turned around in surprise, looked at Diego, and burst out laughing. I was thinking of how to introduce you to each other, and it turns out you've already met? The girl jumped up. Granny, it's not funny at all. I was just telling her that he splashed me from a puddle and then yelled at me. Calm down, Elisa, I don't believe he did it on purpose. I haven't known Diego for long, but he seemed decent to me. Elisa, we know you can be impulsive. Now, go to the bathroom and change your clothes. Let's put these torn jeans in the washing machine so you can walk around in proper attire for once. Granny looked disapprovingly at Elisa's tattered jeans while Diego tried to hide a smirk. Luckily, he had brought decent clothes with him, at least according to Esmeralda's standards. As Elisa passed by Diego, he suddenly stuck his tongue out at her, unnoticed by Esmeralda. It infuriated her so much that her nostrils flared. She immediately shot a fist gesture at him. I see it all, Granny looked at Elisa over her glasses. The girl snorted angrily and disappeared into the bathroom. Diego tried to maintain a serious expression on his face and not to laugh. He didn't want Esmeralda to see him as frivolous, just like she perceived Elisa. Don't be mad at her, Elisa is a good girl, it's just her nature. She's like a matchstick, you know? When she was 15, she got hit by a car because a boy dropped his ball on the road. Just an ordinary ball. It rolled onto the street, and the little boy started crying. Elisa rushed after the ball, saved it, and even gave it back to the kid, but then she got hit. She spent a month in the hospital, all because she acts first and thinks later. Diego thought that her actions weren't very intelligent, but Esmeralda's words made him respect the girl. Apparently, the incident hadn't changed her. Elisa remained just as fiery and passionate. It didn't matter. The important thing was that she was alive and real. When she came out of the bathroom, Esmeralda wasn't in the room. Elisa had already walked into the kitchen and only then noticed that Granny wasn't there. But she couldn't back down, and Diego immediately understood that. She plopped down on the couch opposite him. Elisa, let's make peace. I'm not as bad as you think of me, really. I didn't mean to make a mess, I apologize. She looked at him in surprise and then snorted. But then you should forgive me too. It's my fault, these headphones always let me down. Esmeralda had already gone to bed long ago, but Elisa and Diego were still sitting in the kitchen. So, what now? Are you going to visit all sorts of cafes and try everything they cook? Exactly. Great, what a job. Diego looked at her seriously. Elisa, maybe you could help me a bit. She looked at him with surprise. How? Well, you see, if I go alone to all these cafes, people will quickly suspect something. But if I'm with a lady, they'll just think I'm trying to impress you if they happen to notice us together. You want me to go with you? Elisa's eyes widened, and she looked like a naive child. Exactly. Well, if, of course, you have enough time. But it can be expensive. You shouldn't worry about that at all. Consider that the company covers all expenses. Elisa didn't resist for long, or rather, all she could do was endure a momentary pause. Yes, I agree, and a little more, and she would have clapped her hands in excitement. Diego smiled. And what about your evening dress? Do you have one? Sorry to ask. I'd like to start with a restaurant. Elisa blushed. Actually, I'm not a beggar. Of course, I have one. Diego felt embarrassed. I didn't mean that at all. It's just that you're young, and you probably wouldn't be interested in going to a fancy restaurant. 
Cafes have a different atmosphere, and it's not necessary to buy an evening dress if you don't need one. He stumbled a bit while explaining, but Elisa understood. It's all right. I recently went to a friend's wedding, so I had to buy one. To Diego's surprise, Elisa had excellent manners. Although he scolded himself for having such thoughts. Of course, she wouldn't burst out laughing or do anything inappropriate in a decent restaurant. Nevertheless, he couldn't help but be surprised how she transformed and how adeptly she handled all the tableware. When they entered the restaurant, Diego immediately noticed that there almost were no guests at all. Strange, everything seemed fine. But shortcomings became apparent once they sat at the table. Diego noticed that the beautiful tablecloth, which looked nice from a distance, was covered in stains. Not fresh ones, of course, but old, worn-out stains that significantly marred its appearance. This indicated that the owner's business might not be going very well. On the other hand, the owner could simply be greedy or not good at running a restaurant. Furthermore, they had to wait for the waiter for over 10 minutes, despite the nearly empty dining hall. When they tried to place an order, they found out that more than half of the items listed in the menu were unavailable. Then why are they even offered in the menu? The waiter shrugged with a bored expression. Elisa smiled. Just tell us what you do have, so we don't waste your precious time. The waiter perked up a bit. Judging by the constantly vibrating phone in his pocket, his time was indeed precious. He quickly listed a few dishes from memory, and they placed their order. Yeah, it's a bit depressing here. Elisa smiled again. You haven't been anywhere yet. Believe me, this restaurant is considered one of the fancier ones in our town. When their order arrived, Diego realized that the cow whose meat was used for the steak, had definitely died a long time ago, leaving behind a lot of descendants. He pushed his plate away and started watching Elisa eating. She noticed his gaze and said awkwardly, Didn't have time to eat today. Came here right after work. And where do you work? She waved her hand dismissively. Over there, we sew sportswear. Diego couldn't resist and asked, Did you study to become a seamstress? Elisa laughed. No, I always dreamed of becoming a chef, a real one, so that everyone would know me and I could amaze everyone with my cooking. But I ended up studying accounting and now work in a sewing workshop. Wow, quite a list you have there. Why don't you work as an accountant then? Have you tried finding a job right after finishing school? No one needs an accountant who's just graduated. They all want workers with 90, 60, 90 years of experience. Diego laughed. Are you kidding? Not at all. Honestly, there aren't many job opportunities in our town. I've already noticed that. I think you shouldn't torture your teeth anymore. If anyone cooks deliciously in this town, it's your grandmother. You hit the nail on the head there. Granny always cooked so well that I had to move back to my parents' apartment, otherwise I'd gain a lot of weight. You? I'll never believe that. You'll have to. I'll show you some photos later. The same waiter approached them, bringing a rather substantial bill. Elisa seemed about to protest, and Diego saw it in her eyes. He quickly squeezed her hand, and she fell silent. Young man, can you tell me if the owner is around? Diego asked the waiter. The waiter sighed, apparently thinking they were going to complain about something. He's here, and what do you want? Ready to complain if I'm five minutes late? Diego smiled. He thought to himself that the waiter wasn't disciplined at all. No, young man, I just want you to give him a note from me. Diego wrote a few words on a torn piece of paper from his notepad. He didn't bother folding it. He knew the waiter would read it. The waiter glanced at the note casually, raising his eyebrows, nodded, and disappeared. They stepped outside. How about taking a walk? Diego suggested. Elisa shrugged. Sure, the weather is nice. They'd been wandering for so long that Diego's legs grew tired. They were chatting about everything, but they found it so intriguing. It turned out Elisa lives just three houses away from her grandmother. 
When they stopped in front of her building, Diego stared at her for a while, then suddenly pulled her close and kissed her, and Elisa didn't even try to pull away. As he walked home, Diego thought that it was the first time something like this had happened to him. He kissed a girl he was infatuated with and didn't spend the night with her. Diego, this isn't like you, he said to himself and entered the building. Hey, you. Listen, is it you? You want by the restaurant or what? Diego quickly jumped back against the wall. Don't worry, I won't touch you. It was a man, with tattoos and a menacing look giving away his rough demeanor. What do you want? I'm the owner, and I want to talk. Well, you picked quite a good time for such talks. I did, but I wanted to see you. Come tomorrow, after 12, and we'll discuss it. All right, I'll come. The man left the entrance, and Diego thought that he shouldn't have declined the security his father offered him. He would have to call for it in the morning because it seemed like a deal was going to happen. The next day, as Diego had anticipated, he bought the restaurant. Moreover, he bought it for much cheaper than he expected. The previous owner was quite pleased with the deal. You see, I know nothing about this business. I just got out of prison and got an inheritance out of blue. I never really knew my grandpa. I was just a little kid when we hung out. Then I ended up in jail, and he was in the business, and now this. I've been struggling here for a year, and the restaurant stopped making any profit. I'm already neck deep in debt. Now I'll settle and finally hit to the sea with a clear conscience. I've never been to the sea. I spent my whole life behind bars. Diego could see that the man was happy, as if he had made the most profitable deal of the century. But Diego himself was also content. He didn't have to stay in this town for as long as he thought. Now he needed to work hard, and he really wanted to. He already knew what he wanted to have here. By the way, this morning he found a suitable place for the base at a reasonably good price. In the evening, Elisa called him. So, are we going somewhere today? Of course, we are. Where? You'll find out soon. Curiosity killed the cat. Oh, please, don't even start, Elisa laughed. And Diego said, In half an hour, I'll be near your house. Yes, sir. They drove outside the city. Diego had to go to his hometown the next day because he needed to buy equipment and, in general, he had things to do there. Elisa didn't know about it yet. When he stopped by a small lake he had stumbled upon, Elisa looked at him in surprise. Are we having a picnic, or are we also going to test some food here? Indeed. Today, I'll treat you to my signature grilled meat. Elisa clapped her hands. I love barbecue. I love being in nature. Diego couldn't resist and kissed her again. They sat by the shore, drinking wine, laughing, and suddenly Elisa became serious. Diego, how are you going to drive home? You've been drinking. He looked at her in surprise. I thought we'd spend the night here. You see, I need to go back home tomorrow, just for a couple of weeks, which means I won't see you for so long. He knew he was spewing some romantic nonsense like a teenager, but Elisa believed him. How? Are you leaving? Tears welled up in her eyes. Diego wiped away a tear from her cheek. I am. I bought that restaurant and now I need to buy everything for it. But it's not forever? I actually plan to live here. Really? Absolutely. Elisa reached out for him, and Diego lifted her in his arms. He looked into her eyes for a moment, then carried her to the car. Diego. Yes? I've never been with anyone before. Diego felt a rush of heat. This was a twist he had never encountered before either. He felt like his reasoning was clouded. Nothing could stop him now. They didn't close their eyes that night. By morning, when he pulled up to Elisa's home, she hugged him tightly. Please have a rest. Don't drive in this state. Okay, and what about you? I have a day off. I'll go to sleep right away. Diego tenderly kissed her. Good night. I'd say a good morning. 
Diego had only slept for two hours when the alarm rang. He jumped up and had the cold shower. Esmeralda was not there, but there was a note on the kitchen table. I'm at the market. We'll be back after lunch. Well, that was good. He wouldn't have to face Elisa's grandmother. He took out a few bills from his wallet, placed them on the table, and wrote on the note, Thank you, I've left. Buy yourself a decent TV. His father greeted him as if Diego had been away for years. Son, you seem different, more grown up. But dad, I was gone for less than two weeks. Did I really change that much during that time? Of course, you left as just my son, as Diego, and came back as a restaurant owner. Come on, tell me everything and show me around. However, they didn't get a chance to discuss business immediately as Mrs. Eleanor Ibanez, who had worked as a housekeeper for Diego's father for as long as he could remember, intercepted them. Really? Your child has just arrived. He's hungry and tired, and you're making him work? Christian Bertotti tried to protest, but then waved his hand. All right, feed your overgrown child. Diego missed both Mrs. Ibanez and his father. Cornelia visited a few times. While eating Mrs. Eleanor's signature soup, Diego raised an eyebrow. And what did she want? She kept asking where you had gone and even planned to visit you. Diego scoffed. Interesting, why would she do that? You should know better than anyone, there must be reasons. Diego liked Cornelia, she was beautiful and knew how to present herself well. For a businessman, Cornelia would make a good match. She was a bit greedy, but right now there weren't many other options, were there? His mind obediently presented an image of Elisa, but Diego immediately dismissed it. Of course, Elisa was the most wonderful thing that had happened in his life, but it was just a fling. There was no chance they could be together. Elisa was too simple and naive. Would she just stay at home while he attended receptions and events alone? Of course not. On such occasions, there should be a girl like Cornelia by his side, or even better, Cornelia herself. He spent the whole evening showing his father the photographs and explaining his plans. Christian listened attentively, flipping through one picture after another. You've done a great job, and most importantly, you got the restaurant at a great deal, Christian looked at the map. I understand there's nothing similar nearby. But there are many things you should pay attention to. Diego glanced at the map. What do you mean? Look, there's a children's entertainment center not far from here. You should create a children's menu and advertise it. For the time being, you could allow hosting banquets, and later, you can decide what to do. Dad, you're a genius. I didn't even think about that. Of course, we need a children's menu. They chatted a little more and then went to bed. The next day had too many plans. Closer to lunchtime, Cornelia finally caught him. Hey, where did you disappear to? I was away, opening a new branch. Not bad. Why didn't you call? Maybe I would have joined you, Cornelia smirked, her plump lips curling up. Diego smiled. Would you have come? With you, even to the ends of the earth. Seriously? Of course. Then, be ready in two weeks. Diego left, and Cornelia immediately grabbed her phone to tell all her friends that Diego practically proposed to her. However, leaving in two weeks didn't work out, nor even within three months. When it was almost time to depart, Diego's father suffered a stroke. He was walking home, having left work early because he felt unwell, and right on the path leading to the house, he collapsed. Mrs. Ibanez immediately spotted him, called an ambulance, and didn't touch him, but her quick actions helped save his life. Cornelia had to be patient. When Christian fully recovered, Diego started preparing for his departure again. Cornelia thought it was finally her time, and she was ready before Diego. To be honest, Cornelia had gotten quite tired of him, but she didn't say anything. As a companion, she was just perfect. While still at home, Diego found a nice cottage he was planning to buy right away. However, he hadn't mentioned anything about it to Cornelia. 
Just before leaving, he had a loud argument with his father. Cornelia probably overheard it, so she assumed they had quarreled. Nevertheless, Cornelia arrived later. Or rather, she would come to stay for a couple of days. By the way, they had a really good time together then, but she would leave again, unable to bear the boredom. Diego had even gotten used to this arrangement. He had a girlfriend, beautiful, fashionable, and the rest of the time, he could work calmly. But then Cornelia moved in with her things, and he couldn't tell her that he didn't want to see her. So, she came and lived there. Cornelia immediately turned his home into some kind of storage space for colorful rags. Strangely, no housekeeper could get along with her, so there was always a mess in the house. Diego tried to spend as much time as possible at work, but even there, she bothered him. He had to set a condition that if Cornelia showed up at his workplace without notice, he would simply withhold her money. Cornelia got offended. They didn't speak to each other for two weeks, but as soon as she needed something, she found a way to make up, and she always had the same way, a way that the young and energetic Diego couldn't resist. Today, everything seemed normal. There were traditional Christmas preparations. He didn't know how she even found out about it, although he wasn't surprised. He was buying gifts for the orphanage every year, and she knew about it. However, Cornelia had never tried to dictate her rules before, but now, she was giving orders. Diego was about to leave his office when his phone rang in his pocket. For heaven's sake, who is calling? With these words, he grabbed the phone and answered the call. But it was his father. Yes, Dad. Diego, what happened? The young man sat back in the chair. Nothing. Why did you think something happened to me? Well, son, I've known you for many years, so come on, tell me. Diego smiled. His father always knew everything. Tell me, Dad. What do you do when a woman wants to get married, wants to lead you, wants to be with you everywhere, and you don't want any of it? I see. Cornelia. Well, what did you expect, son? You're to blame too. You've been together for so long, not just for one year, and you still haven't married her. But I never intended to. You should have told her about that. Diego, you're not 15 anymore. You have to take responsibility for your actions. Understand, Cornelia, time is passing, and you're indecisive. Either get married or, to be honest, nothing good will come out of this. You understand that there will be a terrible scandal, right? I understand, Dad. Now I understand that I don't want to see her anymore. It's your decision to make. As far as I know, besides Cornelia, you have no one else. Still don't want to marry? No, Dad. I'm sure I don't want to, and today I became completely convinced of that. Well, it seems I won't get any grandchildren. Diego laughed. So, you're only thinking about yourself, not about your son? Well, you can see it that way. Dad, why are you calling then? Not to talk about Cornelia, right? No, of course not, Diego. You're going to congratulate the kids tomorrow, right? Yes, have you forgotten the date? No, I just suddenly felt like coming too. Diego stood up. You know I'd be very happy about that. But can I ask? Go ahead. Why haven't you visited since I moved here? Is it because of Carmen Borrego? He heard his father's heavy breathing. Well, you could say that. I once made a big mistake. I really liked her, and she liked me too. I don't hide that. I offered her to become my mistress. I promised her a life of luxury if she went away with me. She even asked again, a mistress? And like a fool, I confirmed it. Diego was taken aback by his father's confession. Are you serious? And what did she do? She slapped me and told me to go away, told me to never cross her path again, and I got offended. How could she reject me like that? Well, so many years have passed, and I'm old now, but I still can't forget her. Well, Dad, it's still uncertain who of us is the more foolish one. Christian laughed. You're right about that. So, you'll be waiting for me tomorrow? Yes, I'll be waiting. 
I'll sort out some things today. Diego headed home. He never showed up at home at this time, but today he wanted to end things with Cornelia. He knew there would be a lot of yelling. Cornelia wouldn't just leave without a fuss. He was even prepared to offer her some financial compensation. The house was quiet. He thought he came for nothing, and Cornelia was probably hanging out with her friend somewhere. But then he heard her voice. She was talking from the bedroom, apparently on the phone. Diego headed there. Sweetie, why are you upset? I can't do anything. This dumbass is so stubborn. What am I supposed to say to him? That he should marry me immediately because I'm pregnant? What if he finds out it's not true? He won't propose before putting a ring on my finger. Diego froze. Who was she being so open with? Which of her friends, he wondered. But at that moment, a male voice was distinctly heard from the bedroom. Cornelia, you keep feeding me promises for a whole year. Do you seriously think I'll wait any longer? I have much more lucrative offers. Diego pushed the door. Did I interrupt you? Cornelia squealed and pulled the blanket over herself. A muscular, dark-haired, handsome man quickly started getting dressed. No, I didn't agree on this. Why do I need it? He quickly slipped past Diego, who didn't even attempt to stop him. So it's my fault, right? All my fault got it. I'm not arguing with you. I just wanted to ask if you need help packing your things or you'll manage on your own. I'm not going anywhere. Then you'll leave in disgrace. Don't forget we have cameras here. I've never watched them, but now I can. You, you scum, you jerk. Cornelia grabbed her things and threw them into suitcases. Diego smiled as he watched her. Little did she know he would have never installed a camera in the bedroom. And after half an hour of screaming and cursing, Cornelia finally sat in a taxi. Diego sighed. It felt so good. He needed to go to the orphanage, see how the preparations were going. He got into his car. It was wonderful to feel free. I wonder who that guy was. Well, actually, it's not interesting at all, he thought to himself. Diego arrived at the gate. It seemed like the kids hadn't returned yet. But Carmen Borrego was definitely there. He knew she always personally supervised the setting up of the Christmas tree and then helped decorate it. He walked along the path and stopped to pet the big shaggy dog, which, by the way, was simply called Dog. The kids found him as a tiny pup under the fence, took care of him, hid him from the caregivers until he no longer fit under the beds. Carmen Borrego almost had a heart attack when she saw this huge creature. She immediately called the shelter and then him. Diego arrived and all the kids rushed to him in tears. They asked him to talk to Carmen Borrego so she wouldn't take their friend away. The kids called him different names and interrupted each other. Quiet. What's the dog's name? We all call him differently. I see. Let's just call him Dog then. How did you manage to hide him for so long? He barks and growls. No, he never barks, ever. Carmen Borrego said right away. You see, I told you he's sick. That's what I was talking about. He's not sick. The younger kids were openly crying, and Diego had to take the dog to the veterinarian. The dog turned out to be healthy and well-fed. But why is he so quiet? Because he has no reason to bark. He's perfectly fine. Together, they managed to convince Carmen Borrego not to throw the dog away or send him to a shelter. So, he settled in, mostly outside but sleeping with the watchman. Everyone fed him, whoever felt like it, so he ended up looking more like a small bear. Diego finally made it to the door. He needed to tell Carmen Borrego in a tactful way that his father was coming tomorrow so it wouldn't catch her off guard. She had almost lost her mind a few years ago when she found out about Christian's stroke. Diego regretted telling her at all. There was no one in the hall, but he could hear the cane from the auditorium. He headed there. Carmen Borrego and her staff were decorating the Christmas tree. Hello, everyone, the girls greeted him and continued working, while Carmen looked at him with a frightened expression. 
Diego, weren't you supposed to come tomorrow? Well, I decided to come today. Ah. She didn't finish her sentence because Diego noticed someone hiding behind the lower branches of the Christmas tree. Come out, Diego crouched down, and the branches of the tree opened up. From there, a boy about three, maybe four years old, stepped out. He looked at Diego as if he had just committed the world's worst crime, and Diego felt like he did. Thousands of thoughts raced through his mind, and the most sensible one kept repeating. He couldn't understand. Was he dreaming, or was this some kind of joke? The boy stopped in front of him, staring at him with a disapproving look. His eyes were exactly the same as Diego's, unblinking as they gazed at him. Diego couldn't understand what to say, the child was like a small version of him. It was evident that something connected them. Just now, Diego couldn't fathom that this child could be related to him. Perhaps Carmen Borrego could shed some light on the situation before turning to his father. It couldn't be a coincidence that she looked so frightened. Diego absentmindedly scratched his nose with the palm. He had been trying to get rid of this habit for years, but when he was nervous, he could rub his nose so vigorously that it turned red. Almost in sync with him, the boy also reached for his nose and scratched it in exactly the same way Diego did. And then the man decided to turn to Carmen Borrego. Carmen, who is this boy? Is he one of your wards whose parents abandoned him? She looked at him perplexed. Why do you ask? Carmen, since you're trying to evade the answer, it's becoming clear to me that you understand why I'm asking, and what's going on, and where it all comes from. Tell me, do you not notice how similar we are? Carmen Borrego stared intently at the boy and then at Diego. Really? I can't see it. Is that so? You can't see it? Could it be that there's something wrong with my vision? Maybe I should call someone else to have a look. Diego himself didn't understand why he was getting so agitated, but it was clear that Carmen Borrego had nothing to do with this. However, she must have known where this boy came from, and if the boy wasn't related to him, she wouldn't be so frightened. The boy approached Diego and offered him a candy. Don't shout, please. Diego took the candy, feeling confused. Thank you, I won't shout, I promise. He turned to Carmen Borrego again, and a wild thought flashed through his mind. Could his father and Carmen be somehow involved? No, that couldn't be right. They were too old for that. Carmen, where did this boy come from? You can see how much we resemble each other. It's obvious we're not strangers. But what connects us? Or rather, who? If someone abandoned this boy, I'll raise hell to find out. The boy wasn't abandoned, and he has nothing to do with you. Diego froze. He recognized the voice immediately. He had wanted to call or at least send a text to apologize so many times, but then he decided he hadn't promised anyone anything. On the other hand, Elisa never called him either, although she could have. Now he stood there, realizing that Elisa was standing behind him, and he was afraid to turn around. The pieces of the puzzle quickly fell into place. A boy who resembled him, Elisa, whom he had played with and then abandoned. There was no need to think any further, it was all clear. The only unclear thing was what would happen now, judging by Elisa's voice, nothing good. Diego was watching the boy circling him, then the child approached Elisa. Mommy. Elisa picked him up and hugged him close. He finally looked into her eyes. Hello, Elisa. Hello, Diego, she turned around and walked towards the exit, while Diego stood there like a complete idiot. What could he do? To run after her and say, oh, this is my son? He imagined her response, and it was not something he wanted to hear. What a fool he was. Carmen Borrego sighed standing next to him. Come with me, Diego. I'll make you some coffee, he obediently followed her, feeling completely lost. The woman made coffee, placed a cup in front of him, sat down, looked at him, and began to speak. I don't even know. All this time, we blamed you for what you did to Elisa and Fidel. But now I look at you and realize you're just as pitiful. His name is Fidel? 
Yes, Elisa named him after her grandfather. Why didn't she tell me anything? I had no idea. Everything could have been so different. The principal sighed. What exactly? Diego, would you have married Elisa just because you had a child together and both of you would have suffered for the rest of your lives or would you have taken Fidel away from her? What a nonsense. Why would I have taken the child away from his mother? But the thing is, Elisa came to your house. She was desperate. Fidel was very ill at that time and her grandmother was also seriously ill. The girl was torn apart. She was so desperate for money. The treatment for Fidel was so expensive that even with our help, she wouldn't have managed. Esmeralda Gallardo transferred ownership of her apartment to Elisa, telling her to sell it. They had just managed to sell it and move in with Elisa when her grandmother passed away. Elisa was strong. She held on and went to the capital. She stayed there for almost half a year. Fidel's health improved during that time. Wait, she never came to me. Do you really think I would have refused to help her? Your girlfriend was probably there. She understood everything immediately and told Elisa that if she ever saw her again, she would do everything to take the child away from her. Cornelia? Diego grabbed his head and sat like that for a while, then looked up at Carmen Borrego looking completely worried. What should I do now? I don't know, Diego. I'm not good at giving advice in such matters, but something needs to be done. I can see how much you're struggling. Why is my son struggling? The cheerful voice of his father seemed to come out of nowhere, and Diego looked up, and the smile vanished from Christian's face. Son, what happened? Diego didn't even know how to tell him about it. Dad, I have a son, and you have a grandson. Christian quietly sank into his chair. How is that possible? Carmen jumped up and handed Christian a glass of water. He took the glass from her, held her gaze a little longer than necessary. Thank you. The woman looked embarrassed and sat back down. Diego started telling the story without going into too many details, but enough to convey what a scoundrel he had been. Unexpected, isn't it? And what do you plan to do? I don't know, Dad. Of course, I need to do something, but I'm afraid Elisa won't let me get anywhere near her or our son. Christian looked at him attentively. And she'd be right. You know, son, I never thought I'd say this, but don't repeat the same mistakes I made. A long time ago, I could have been happy and made someone else happy too, but life is full of rules and conditions. We lost so many years, almost our whole life, but now I know for sure that I won't leave Carmen, and even if we don't have as much time left as we'd like, at least it's something. You've already deprived yourself of your son for so long, and now you need to make up for it. Just don't lie to Elisa, she's been through so much for you already. If you don't love her, just say so. Don't try to marry her without love. I think if you're honest with her, she won't object to you spending time with Fidel. Diego jumped up. Dad, you're right about everything. Thank you. He rushed out of the office. Christian looked up at Carmen. Hello, Carmen. Hello, Christian. Listen, Carmen, however you want it, but I won't leave without you. Maybe it will be hard for you to forgive me for those foolish words, for that proposal, but I will try to make up for my mistakes. Carmen stubbornly pressed her lips together, then relaxed. Oh, Christian, I regret it so much that I refused you back then. I didn't need your money, but I needed you. It was so hard without you, simply unbearable. I scolded myself for the last words, for not going with you, I should have been by your side. Christian lowered his head. Perhaps foolishness is our distinguishing feature. Both mine and Diego's. Carmen smiled. Don't worry, I'm sure they will manage to talk. I don't know about Diego, but Elisa still loves him. Carmen, why didn't you tell me anything? I would have solved all of Elisa's and my grandson's problems. Elisa wouldn't have accepted your help. She's a bit different. Diego was racing through the city. He remembered exactly where Elisa lived, but he had no idea what he would say to her yet. 
On the way, he saw a toy store and slammed on the brakes. He entered the store so abruptly that it startled the young saleswoman. Miss, do you have something for a boy aged three to four? What exactly are you interested in? Everything. Bring me everything you have for this age. Diego parked the car in an available spot, but he didn't rush to get out. He was just afraid. After sitting there for about 10 minutes, he finally got out. He was a man, so he must have been brave. Diego hesitated for a long time before ringing the doorbell. Eventually, the door opened. You? It's me. He moved Elisa aside and entered the apartment. Fidel came out to meet him. He looked surprised at the pile of boxes in Diego's hands. The man knelt down in front of the boy. Hello. Hello. I brought all this for you. For me? Yes, for you. The boy cautiously touched one of the boxes, then looked at Elisa. Tears were welling up in her eyes. She had dreamed of seeing her son next to Diego like this. No, she couldn't cry now. Mom? Fidel looked questioningly at his mother, and she smiled and nodded. The boy let out a joyful sigh that Diego couldn't help but smile. Five minutes later, they eagerly opened the boxes, taking out cars and robots. Each new toy was accompanied by a new exclamation of joy. Not only Fidel, but Diego himself squealed with delight. Elisa was sitting down on the couch. She didn't want to smile, but looking at Diego crawling on the floor and playing with some car, making strange noises, she couldn't help but smile. Fidel, on the other hand, picked the biggest car for himself and growled no quieter than Diego. When they had another car accident, Elisa decisively stood up. Okay, reckless drivers, it's time to wash your hands and have dinner. But mom, Fidel was about to pout, but Diego nudged him gently. What? At every job, people have lunch breaks, drivers do have them too. The boy looked at him in surprise. Even you have one? Of course. And if you finish everything, I'll let you steer a real car. Fidel looked so excited. They raced each other to the bathroom to wash their hands. During lunch, they were mostly silent, but Fidel chatted nonstop. Diego learned that now Sergio wouldn't boast about his toy car anymore because Fidel had better ones. Towards the end of the meal, Fidel started sniffing, and Elisa stood up, took him in her arms, and left. Diego heard Fidel muttering, I won't go to sleep. Elisa smiled and replied, Of course, you won't. About ten minutes later, Diego cautiously entered the room, and Fidel was fast asleep, hugging his big toy car. Elisa was sitting, staring at one point. Finally, she seemed to come back to herself, stood up, and walked past him to the kitchen. Diego followed her. Elisa, I don't know how to find the right words. I understand that they are all useless, and I don't deserve forgiveness. Elisa remained silent. He approached her. Say something, please. You must understand that now I won't leave you and Fidel. She turned slowly, looked into his eyes, remained silent for a while, then said, Are you sure you want all this? Of course, I'm sure. I've never been more certain in my life. Elisa, I know I missed everything, messed up in the best way I could, but let me make it right. I'm not stopping you. You can come to see Fidel whenever you want. That's not enough for me. She raised her eyebrows in surprise, then asked somewhat fearfully, what do you want then? Do you want to take him away? No, no, not at all. I want us to have a normal family, you know? A real family. Elisa moved away from him. If it's for Fidel's sake, then it's not necessary. No, it's not just for Fidel. He has nothing to do with it. She tried to pull away from him even further, but Diego held her close. When he started kissing Elisa, he felt calm and light, as it happens when a person returns to where they've wanted to be for a long time. They were interrupted by a phone call. Diego didn't really want to detach himself from Elisa, but he still reached for the phone. It was his father. Diego, where are you? Dad, I'm at Elisa's with Fidel. 
All right, is she there with you? Yes. Put it on speaker, Diego was surprised, but complied with his father's request. Elisa, I want to apologize to you on behalf of myself and my foolish son. Forgive him, don't waste any more time. I really want to experience what it is to be a grandpa. Elisa barely smiled, and Christian continued. I'm calling you on business. Carmen Borrego and I have just decided to get married. If you hurry, we can have the wedding on the same day. Father hung up, and Elisa looked at Diego strangely while he looked at her. Elisa, I will say all the words I should have said all this time. I know you can make quick decisions. Please, marry me. I will do everything to make sure you never regret your decision, everything for Fidel to forget that he ever didn't have a dad. Elisa didn't think for long. I agree. Diego lifted her up, twirled around, and then grabbed the phone. Please, reserve a spot for us there. When Fidel wake up, and we'll be on our way. I woke up. Diego turned around. In the doorway stood a sleepy Fidel, holding the same toy car in his hands. Diego smiled. Dad, we'll be there soon. My son woke up. It was the first time he said that word so freely, and Fidel looked at him seriously. Are you my dad? Yes, Fidel. Where were you? Diego looked puzzled at Elisa. She had already sat down in front of their son. Dad was working, but now he's back. He won't leave again? Diego shook his head negatively. Never. The little boy thought for a moment. Can I tell Sergio that I have a dad too? Of course, we'll tell Sergio together. Diego embraced his little son. What an unusual feeling. It almost made him want to cry. The next day, they were all at the orphanage. The children were still having breakfast while Diego, Elisa, and Christian were arranging the gifts. Diego was doing everything with one hand, and the other hand was firmly holding Elisa's palm. Christian smiled. He could see it all perfectly. Yesterday was a wonderful day. It seemed to him that he shed at least 20 years, if not more. The door opened, and Christian barely managed to play a Christmas children's song when the hall was filled with children. They didn't rush to the Christmas tree or grab the presents. They just stood aside and admired everything. Elisa decided to take the initiative, and Diego joined her. They started handing out gifts, pink packets, and boxes for girls, blue ones for boys. When everyone, including Fidel, had their gifts, Diego turned to Elisa. I have a gift for you too. He took out a small box from his pocket. Here. I'm sorry I didn't buy it yesterday. I didn't know if you'd forgive me or not. And, honestly, I never expected to be this happy today. Can I put it on you? Elisa reached out her hand, and Diego took out a beautiful ring. Then he gently kissed Elisa's hand. They didn't notice that Carmen and Christian were standing nearby, hugging, and watching them. Dad, help me. Diego looked at Fidel in surprise. He was even taken aback until he realized that the word dad referred to him. Diego smiled and sat down, saying, Of course, son, what's the matter? This small town had never seen such a wedding in all its existence. Of course, they held the wedding at Diego's restaurant, which had long become the most popular in the city. So many guests arrived that all the hotels were fully booked, and flower shop owners stared in horror at the empty shelves. The wedding ceremony itself took place on the platform in front of the restaurant. Three men were standing near the doors, two adults and one little boy, three generations of men who would become happy today. They all wore black tuxedos, including Fidel. Proudly, he held his dad's hand and then thought for a moment, taking his grandpa's hand too. Dad, don't you think they should be here by now? Yes, I guess we should have insisted on them arriving together. You're right. Fidel said importantly, Mom never runs late. Diego smiled, and Christian laughed. Well, Diego, it seems your Elisa will bring my Carmen on time. A long white limousine turned into the parking lot. Fidel gasped. Wow, what a long car. They went to meet it, 
and the car stopped. Diego opened the door and extended his hand to Elisa. She looked at him carefully and placed her hand in his. Then Carmen appeared. Fidel seriously inspected both women. You both look beautiful today, but I think I look better. Everyone laughed, and Christian said, We don't doubt that at all. Now Fidel took both Elisa's and Carmen's hands and led them to where the guests were waiting, where they would become husband and wife. The wedding was certainly interesting, but the sooner it was over, the faster he could return to playing with his toy cars. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.